a hearty good morning to everybody that is out there. I see that Julia and Buddy are the first ones up all the way from Atlanta. We love you and it is good to see you up there this morning. There is <coughs> Miss Elisa along with, I believe, Cam and Kara and Cody. Good morning. I dropped by and uh, school was in session. Everybody was in class. It was quiet and uh, Hope you had a great day. Miss Terry, God bless you. I love you. And as more comes on, there's my dear Miss Cherry, my own dear love. I love her too. She's right upstairs. Yesterday was a one for the, the, the books, was it not? I talked to a couple of uh, people after the broadcast, and uh, they said, we lost it and couldn't get back. And, uh, well, I'm going to tell everybody the problem yesterday was massive, apparently, because uh, by the time we got done, we had, uh, the, the, the Internet had shut it down five different times. And so there are, I believe, four or five postings out there on the Facebook page that, uh, uh, you know, Every time I come online, it'd be a new post, a new post, a new post. Uh, so it's really chopped up, really choppy. Most people didn't get it. Uh, you didn't get uh, much of it or, or much at all, any of it. I uh, called uh, Xfinity, said, we got a problem going here. Uh, Sherry did, and uh, they were going to send a technician out today, and then she got a text message uh, from them saying problem resolved we found what the problem was we fixed it uh keep us posted so uh, hopefully the the problem that was on our end of things uh, is corrected 
and we're not going to have this hodgepodge and break up. But uh, with that in mind, uh, just to share, uh, I'm going to go ahead and and re. Uh, well, you know, it probably won't be entirely the same lesson, but it, it's going to be. Uh, yesterday's lesson today so we can keep it its entirety and the people that missed it can get it and maybe if you went out and and took the time and labor to go through all of those uh, you picked up some stuff perhaps though God will open up new avenues for you today but uh, I just didn't feel we were looking at uh, John's question and I I think it's relevant I think it's important to us I think there's a reason uh, behind everything uh, I know I'm I'm not one of these people that believe in in uh, coincidences necessarily. Uh, I think God had a plan that, uh, uh, and there was an interruption in that. Uh, uh, I believe, you know, I, I'm, I'm due to believe that the enemy didn't want whatever was out there to get out there. So we're going to redo the lesson today, see where things go now. This section we've set apart at the very first is uh, is linked to our week of prayer for international missions. On Monday, we were talking about medical missions, particularly uh, Patrick and I and Stein in North Africa, as they've given themselves to medical missions. But we got medical missionaries all over the world doing uh, great work, wonderful work. Uh, I, I remember showing one some years ago. And uh, the uh, indigenous people that lived in the area said they they would walk uh, uh, past two or three uh, uh, state-owned hospitals to go to the clinic run by Southern Baptists. And they said the reason is, there we get love. Uh, I think that's a great testimony. Uh, so we also uh, viewed a video from Henderson Baptist Church in Oklahoma that accepted God's uh, calling to work with a specific people group. Uh, that are unreached there in North Africa. And Tuesday, we focused on the opportunities yesterday uh, that students uh, have experience, to experience life on the mission field. And uh, we talked about some of them. Uh, we also listened to missionary William Hand as he discussed student opportunities. Now today, we're going to step into the real world, a real world crisis, uh, if you will, in which Southern Baptists have embraced with love and compassion meeting the desperate needs of refugees from the Ukraine and other areas of the world. We're working on the southern border. We're working in Central America with uh, uh, people fleeing Venezuela and going north. Now, as you know, in the spring of this year, Russia invaded the Ukraine, creating a great humanitarian crisis. The Baptists have stepped into in a big, big way. Uh, we have disaster relief people over there manning kitchens. We've got hospitals in the area, in Poland and Moldova, that literally have opened their doors and uh, uh, thrown their arms wide open to make uh, refugee centers out of their churches. Uh, those nations, such as Poland and Moldova, have accepted the bulk of the refugees and, uh, uh, as I said, the Baptist churches in those areas have stepped in with, with, help, with the help of the SBC. Uh, with the help of our disaster relief effort and that branch of uh, of work that we do. For example, Moldova shares uh, an eastern, southern, and, and, and northern border with Ukraine, a western border with Romania. When the news of the war uh, emerged, the Moldavian Baptist Union, comprised of about 400 churches, converted their buildings and their summer camp facilities to and their children homes into shelters. Uh, Danku Baptist Church sent buses to the border to meet refugees. The church began creating a welcoming environment by placing stuffed animals on the beds for children and having school supplies on hand. And they provide Wi-Fi, uh, uh, free uh, home-cooked meals a day, uh, counseling. Uh, I had a problem sorting out the video I wanted to share this morning. So, you know, they're all about a minute long, so I, I, I picked three. Uh, they give us a good picture of what's happening uh, and how we are involved uh, dramatically in what's going on in this refugee crisis. Let's take a look.
I'm here with Pastor Heinrich, just a few kilometers from the border of Ukraine. Well, I'm here with one of our disaster relief volunteers. Food that has been donated and provided for by Southern Baptist, almost a million dollars worth of food. We've seen thousands of mothers, women, ladies, with their children in tears and discouraged by the situation that they were faced with, but happy to be here and touched and moved by the solidarity and the generosity of our people. Steve, why are you here? So I can help and serve the Lord mainly and also get the gospel out. But it's relationships like these that we've had for many years here in Romania and the countries surrounding Ukraine that has allowed us from the first day of this war to be bringing help and hope to the people of Ukraine. If we haven't partners like, like you, this ministry could not happen. I just want to say thank you for your oh, work. Right, yeah, God bless you, man. Thank you, thank Appreciate you. Thank you for all you're doing. Standing here on the Ukrainian border with two of our IMB missionaries who've been ministering to the Ukrainian people for more than 15 years. I know Southern Baptists are praying for the work that we're doing here. What are some specific ways they can pray? Here at the border, seeing buses come, dropping off women and children, uh, not many men at all. Men 18 to 60 are not allowed to cross the border. Pray for these families that are separated during this very stressful time, uh, that they would be comforted. I'd also say, you know, our national partners are there and we want to be able to help them to be able to minister to the people who couldn't leave. There's a shortage of food and water, all the basic necessities of life and through Send Relief, we want to continue to give and to help them to be able to advance the gospel through giving, through meeting needs. I'm here with Kyle, one of our IMB missionaries to Ukraine. Kyle and his family have spent 13 years ministering to the Ukrainian people. Uh, we're hearing news reports every day of millions being displaced by the war in Ukraine. When we hear about displaced peoples, we often don't think about our missionaries. Uh, but Kyle, you and your family have been displaced by this war. What is that like for you? How have you all been dealing with it? It's been very tough. Um, we had a very short window of time to, to pack up. We had one suitcase per person, packed our van and we had to leave. Yeah, we're overwhelmed at times, but at the same time, we're also trying to serve and carry on the missionary task to reach people and make disciples. Well, I've been able to see just in the last couple of days, even as you're in transition, you're digging right in and trying to serve, trying to continue to share the gospel. As you pray for the people impacted by this war, pray for your missionaries. You know, he's right. That's one of the key elements I think that we, uh, we miss in looking at and studying missions of missionary, we see what's going on, we see what's happening. But everything that happens in that region happens to our missionaries there as well. Uh, they're caught up right in the middle of that war. Their home was in the Ukraine. Uh, their house, everything that they had, uh, you know, their work was there in Ukraine. And they had to leave, they had to, to get out, just like, you know, many of the other refugees. But they're doing what they can and ministering uh, there on the border. It is a major crisis. Uh, I've talked to people who have been there. Uh, I have talked to people who have family there. Uh, staying in touch with their families have been very difficult. It's a hard thing. This is a war-torn area, and I don't know that it's going to let up, you know, anytime soon. I think, I think the general consensus was that this thing would be over, you know, in a month, uh, uh, you know, three weeks to a month that uh, they'd be overrun and it'd be over with. But uh, I don't think uh, they realize the uh, the intense <coughs> pushback they were going to get from the Ukrainian people. Uh, in their stand-up and uh, fighting for their freedom. So, uh, you know, these people uh, are being served and ministered to by local churches, aided by, supported, and undergirded by the SBC, uh, and our personnel there, and the work that, that we do in praying and giving here on this side, over a million dollars worth of food at the point of that this video was made. And we've got disaster relief teams just rotating in and out with a constant presence, uh, bringing a constant presence of the gospel there on the borders, both in Moldova and in, uh, in uh, Poland and other areas that are receiving refugees from the Ukraine-Russian war. So uh, there's a lot of things that we can pray for and need to pray for that, uh, you know, for these that are involved in uh, 
in this crisis. So let's go ahead and take some time and pray. Uh, this is our fourth day of prayer in our week of prayer. And again, the emphasis is on ministering to those refugees. Now, we got we got the same kind of thing going on the southern border as people flood over the border, and we're working on both sides of it to try and meet the, uh, the needs of those people. We've got them uh, on the borders of uh, uh, coming out of Venezuela. We're working with them. Uh, here's a couple of videos I've got, you know, from from you know that work that's being done with those coming across the Venezuela border. So we are very active all over the world. And if you want to know where your mission dollars go, well, take a good look because that's exactly where they go. And that's why it's important for us to remember what what our goal is and seek in every way possible to uh, to to seek out God and what He would have us to do and how we would go about helping to meet those needs. Our goal is $12,222. So far, you know, we just launched on Sunday, so we hadn't made one, you know, one word about it until then, and $165 has come in. I know we're a long way from our goal, but you got to start someplace, so let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart that, uh, uh, that you have created a, a, a missionary heart, a missionary spirit within the life of our fellowship, within the church here. Lord, we have no idea uh, of, of, of the things that are, are truly you know, happening in the hearts and lives of people. We're not there. We're not involved in it. Even if we were there, Lord, physically and ministering to those people, Lord, it's very difficult unless we have been in those shoes to understand the impact of having to leave your country because of the violence that uh, that war brings. Lord, it doesn't seem to be any uh, uh, you know discretion. It's all indiscriminate. Uh, hospitals have been bombed. Schools have been bombed. Places of uh, worship have been destroyed. Lord, all, you know, all, for what? For why? Because of man's aggression toward man, uh, man's desire to uh, uh, to exert his own power over the lives of other people, Lord, there are wars and rumor and have been from the fall of man. Maybe we could say that the the first murder out there in a field when Cain slew Abel was an act of war uh, when Satan. Uh, tempted an Eve and Adam fell into that temptation. That was an act of war. And Lord, that seems to be the uh, the albatross that mankind has carried through the ages. And Lord, we understand that uh, it's not over yet. There won't be peace until you come. There will not be peace totally and completely upon the earth. Righteousness will not reign until you come. We look to that day, Lord, with anticipation. Uh, we're closer today to your coming than we were yesterday. And Father, I lift up those workers uh, with refugees there, especially as we think of uh, the Ukraine. Uh, we think, Lord, of the churches in various areas, as we've heard from Moldova and Poland. Lord, I pray that you will meet every need that can, can, can be met that we continue to send food to those areas, we continue to send medical supplies and workers, Lord, doctors and nurses and 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 disaster relief workers and 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 pastors and chaplains and, and everybody on those very delicate places, Lord, to meet and to uh, to share and to pray with and to present the glory of God. Lord, I pray with all my heart that, Lord, you will sustain them and empower them and bless them. Keep safety and protection, Lord, over them. We love you. We thank you, Father, for this day that we can, we can set aside to pray specifically for those who are dealing with the refugees and for those refugees that are having an opportunity to hear the gospel. Thank you, Father. In the blessed and glorious name of our Lord, we pray. Amen and amen. Let's see, Miss Ruth Jeff came in this morning. Good morning, Miss Ruth. I give a shout out to Kenneth, and there's Miss Sue. Good morning, and there's Miss Laura, all the way up from snowy Spokane. Well, we are here, and we are ready to launch into our study. As I said, because the broadcast problems we had yesterday, 
and I've heard from many of you that, that missed the study because of them, I, I felt compelled to go ahead and teach this lesson again, uh, and hopefully we'll do it without a stop uh, and start that we had yesterday that really did absolutely, you know, everybody came back, you know, most came back after the first glitch, the second one, you know, by the time we got to the fourth and fifth, I was the only one online that I'd know about. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to we're going to start uh, uh, that study again, and uh, I, I I don't think we'll have a problem this time. At least uh, Xfinity says they've corrected the problem that we had, and we're going to trust that that is the truth. Now we had looked at you know the Trinity in action, uh, and so far in the Gospel of Mark, we've seen four witnesses that Mark has brought forth, uh, each testifying to the identity of Jesus. Uh, so, you know, by three witnesses, that should have been enough, but we have four. Uh, in, in verse 1, Mark said that Jesus is the Son of God, uh, and this is his gospel that he's going to be presenting. In verses 2 and 3, he calls the prophet uh, forward who said that Jesus is Lord. And in verses 7 and 8, John the Baptist said, Jesus was the one after me who is mightier than I, testifying to the Messiahship of Jesus. And then in verses 10 and 11, God the Father uh, you know, uh, splits open the heaven and rips them open, and, and, and God the Holy Spirit comes down in, in a form like a dove, and uh, so you have you have the Son of God, you have the Spirit of God, and the voice of God coming from heaven and saying, "You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased." So we have the testimony of the Trinity itself as to the identity of Jesus Christ. Uh, but we would be remiss uh, if we didn't, and I attempted to do that yesterday. Go back and let's see. I might as well, you know, get all of that up there, and stop being slow fingered this morning. Uh, where we move next to, and by the way, I corrected my spelling. Uh, the baptizer's question. Uh, now we won't finish with John the Baptist. We'll pick up more on him later. But this guy gives us a full, rounded picture of the man who becomes uh, central to this opening of Mark's gospel. Uh, keep in mind that John the Baptist, you know, he wasn't a man of, of, of weak temperament. He was strong, he was vital, he was founded and absolutely certain in his belief. But even in his life, he came to the point that you and I uh, and others would call a crisis of faith, where he began to question even what he knew about God. Uh, after all, uh, look where trusting Christ had gotten him so far. Matthew gives us his condition in Matthew 14 when he said that Herod had John arrested. He arrested, bound him, and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. Remember, Israel had been uh, over 400 years without the voice of a prophet. And now one true prophet comes forward. And as we have said, hundreds of thousands of people had come out to the wilderness to, to meet John, to uh, uh, even be baptized in the baptism of repentance that John was offering, pointing to the Messiah coming. So he was a very popular character. Uh, you couldn't just do whatever you wanted to with him. You had to tread carefully. So he, he arrested him because he had spoken against uh, John's uh, sexual relationship with his brother's wife. Uh, that uh, angered Herod. He wasn't going to take it, but he only went so far uh, to this point. John stands as a monument that sometimes God's will for one of his children is not comfort and security in this life, but trials and suffering. Uh, now, I know that there is a, uh, uh, a whole segment of Christian society that says if you're suffering or if you're in pain or if you're sick, that uh, you just don't have enough faith or, you know, there's something wrong. They become Job's three friends trying to comfort him and saying, you know, what's wrong with you? Instead of realizing that God was behind everything and that what was happening, God was doing. 
Well, John did everything God told him to do. Now he's in prison. Uh, not a very nice place to be. Uh, you know, he's not the only one. Paul, you know, was given a thorn in the flesh. You know, you know many think, and I tend to follow that line of thought, that it was the uh, eyesight that he had, that he was going blind, probably had in, in some pain. He prayed to have it removed, and God said no. Uh, my gra- he had, and he learned the lesson that God's grace was sufficient, you know, in his weakness. So, you know, not everybody gets the healing they want. Not everybody gets the uh, uh, the house they want, the car they want, and all this. But uh, that doesn't mean that God is not God. John's relationship uh, with the wife, no, Herod's relationship. Did I say John's relationship with the wife? If I did, I misspoke. I was speaking of Herod's relationship with Philip, his brother's wife. Uh, They were in a relationship that was unlawful, and uh, Herod had uh, uh, killed his brother and taken his wife, and he was being condemned by and, 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 you know, warned by John the Baptist, and it was John that was thrown in prison because of that. I hope that's clear. If I made that mistake, uh, that was a faux pas that I should not have made. It is not John in relationship with Philip's wife. It was Herod that was in relationship with Philip's wife. Uh, You're you're welcome. Uh, So how does uh, John, he stands as, as one who is evidence that sometimes God will call. Uh, for that that pathway, doesn't he tell Peter the same thing? You know, Peter, you're gonna you, uh, one day you're gonna go where you you, you don't want to go. Men are gonna carry you where you don't want to go. In other words, uh, uh, it's not gonna be an easy ride. And and of course, we know they did. They carried Peter to a, uh, a cross and where he's crucified. Uh, Paul wasn't let out of prison. Finally, he was uh, beheaded in prison. So. All of the uh, uh, the apostles died uh, a martyr's death, with the exception of John, who uh, suffered greatly over his lifetime. But at any rate, how does Jesus restore John's faith? How does he restore people's confidence in him as a prophet? What steps can we take when we find our faith is tired and our life uh, of life struggle? Well, John's in prison under one of the most wicked tyrants of the ancient world, King Herod, and all this for doing the right thing. When John's faith was being tested, he went to the one place that every one of us need to flee to when tested. He didn't sit and, and bemoan his state. He didn't wring his hands and say, why me? He, he was uh, he certainly had some doubt going on, but he took that doubt to Jesus. He couldn't go physically, but he sent his messengers to Christ. In Luke 7, verses 18 through 20, it says, The disciples of John reported to him about all the things that Jesus was doing. You know, how flocks of people were going to Jesus now, how his disciples were baptizing, how he was doing, you know, miracles. And he, and he brought all of this, even to the fact that there were were, were uh, tax collectors. <coughs> Some things that uh, John couldn't get his mind around. If, his, if, if, if this kind of thing, he's eating with sinners, he's, uh, he's doing all of these things, he hears the criticism, you know, so... Uh, he, he's got these doubts. In verse 19, it said, Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one we've been looking for? Or do we look for someone else? And when the men came to him, Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, uh, Are you the expected one? Or do you look for someone else? I mean, they referred his words exactly. His personal struggles, John's, were beginning to take its toll on his faith. He was wavering, uh, not breaking, not falling apart, but he had questions. You ever been there? Uh, Things happen and they they strike us and we we get to that point where we begin to to waver a little bit, ask questions and and, and, and doubt uh, certain things. As he lay in Herod's castle prison, wondering and thinking, considering, is Jesus the Messiah? Is he really the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of God's people? Is he the one, or should we look for another? Is this really the kingdom of God? Is Israel really being restored? 
Why is all this happening to me? If Jesus is the Messiah, why am I in prison? These would be normal questions, wouldn't they? Most people today, when we doubt, we, we, we don't go to Jesus. We rather build a case on heresy, set up straw men, run to our friends, commiserate with people who are in the same position that we are in, but we don't go to the source. We don't bring it to him and lay at his feet, ask the pertinent questions of him. Where did John go when doubts began to attack his mind? When he doubted Jesus, he went to Jesus. He couldn't personally, so he sent others as his emissary. Uh, he sent those two messengers. And they asked Jesus word for word, which to me perhaps is a miracle, because if you ten, take, take ten people and pass it on down the line, it's going to be a whole lot different uh, than... than uh, <coughs> What was spoken of in the first place? Please pray for a young man named uh, that I, young man, a young man named that I know. All right, uh, we will do that. Father Terry asks us pray for a young man that uh, that she knows. I don't know what this condition is. I don't know, Lord, what it is that he needs. Whether it's his, a relationship with you, a renewed relationship with you. Uh, he, Terry just put it up there. He lost his wife. Father, I pray for this young man who has been widowed. Lord, I know the grief uh, you know, uh, that he must be going through now, the pain and sorrow. I don't know whether there's children involved. May God come along beside him and comfort him. You are the God of comfort, and we ask you to do that. Comfort him and show yourself, Lord, strong and powerful. Show him that you are there. You know, Let him reach out to you and find the comfort that can only come through you. And as Terry reaches out, Lord, let her be an instrument of your comfort and your care. In Jesus' name, amen. At any rate, what was John really asking? He's asking you, the Messiah, are you the Messiah we've been waiting for, or do we need to keep on looking? What we must understand here is that John is no skeptic. Things were go not going the way they thought, and he was confused. He couldn't understand what God was doing. Have you ever been there? Ever been there when things are going on and, and something happens and you ask, why God? You don't understand. Well, some things are beyond our understanding, and we have to, to, to hang on to the one that does know from the end, from the beginning. If you've ever been in that situation, if you've ever been confused and tired out by uh, you know the the very efforts it takes sometimes to live this life that we're living, you've been beat down. You uh, you have a problem that loom, looms larger than anything that you have ever seen. It's it's we you know, uh, in 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 talking about stress management and doing uh, critical stress uh, counseling. You know, it's kind of like I, I, I tell people sometimes an event in our life is so large that uh, it, it can't get in that pipeline to, to go into storage where it needs to do in our brain. It's like it's like when you, you have a sink that is plugged up and uh, the water just won't drain. You have to, the more stuff you pull out of the opening that drain, the faster the water goes. And that's the same way. Sometimes these problems need to be taken apart piece by piece so they can be stored where God intends them to be in our mind. And this is what John is. This problem is looming great in his life. And he needs answers uh, if, if he's ever to come to peace with this. Uh, here's the real issue in, in John's thinking. Do I really believe, do I really trust Christ with my life, even when things are going well, uh, you know, aren't going well? Uh, when I'm in the midst of a, a great trial, do I, you know, can I really believe, do I really trust? John is suffering. And because he's suffering, his, face is, his faith is suffering. So what happens? Jesus is going to send him an answer. And that answer comes this way. I, I love it because he doesn't just turn to the two messengers and say, yep, I'm him. He doesn't do that. In verse 21 through 23 of Luke 7, he says, at that very time, underline that, at that very time, at the very time that they're asking this question of Jesus, is the very time that they're asking, are you the one we were expecting or should we look for another? At that very moment, Jesus 
cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, gave sight to many who were blind. And after perhaps hours of, of, of this work, of praying with and healing and all of that, he turned and answered. And his answer wasn't to say, yes, I am. Here's his answer. Go and report to John what you have heard or what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Jesus simply answers these messengers by a show and tell. He shows them and tells them to go tell. He shows them what he's been up to. And then he gives them scripture and quotes it to them and says, take it back to John. This account is amazing. Jesus is asked the question by John's friends, and then he says, wait over there and watch. You know, at the very time they come to ask the question, there's lines of people out there waiting to come to Jesus. He said, don't take someone else's word for it. I want you to see for yourself. So you can take back a first-hand report of what you've seen and what you've heard. In that hour, Luke tells us that he healed those with diseases and plagues, cast out evil spirit, restored sight to the blind, uh, and, and many things that, that, that are not mentioned. Uh, but uh, what does Jesus say? He said, he, he's the, uh, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, deaf to hear, the dead are raised, the poor, to, the, poor of the gospel preached to them. So uh, they, they saw it all, folks. God has perfect, impeccable timing. You might want to write that down if you forget it from now and again. Now and again I do, that God's timing is always perfect. At the very moment that John's friends have come to Jesus, he has people already lined up to heal so that John's friends could be eyewitnesses and go back and share with John that this is, in fact, the long-expected one. Not only does Jesus show the disciples of John what's been going on, but then he does something to me that's astounding, because he knows John, and he knows John the Baptist is a Bible student or a student of the Old, Old Testament, the First Testament. John knows his scripture, so Jesus quotes two passages of scripture, and he gets John thinking back in order. In fact, you can pull it out of three various places. Scripture gets our focus off ourself and our struggles and sets our mind on the things of God. Jesus quotes Isaiah 35, 5, 61, 1, Isaiah 26, 19. He quotes these scriptures to John, and John knows the context in which these scriptures are formulated and that they're all about that long-expected one, that Messiah. And they all say that during the reign of the Messiah, that, uh, uh, that uh, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Go back and tell John that you saw uh, the blind eyes opened and the deaf ears unstopped. Isaiah 61, 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Remember John, the Spirit coming down on me? He has sent me uh, to the blind and the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and open the prison to those who are about, who abound. That's what that verse says. It's interesting, and we'll look at it in a moment. He doesn't mention the prison's doors opening up at that point in time because, well, we'll discuss that in a moment. Isaiah 26, 19 says, Your dead shall live. And that one of the things that he said. Their bodies will raise, and you will dwell. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is the dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Jesus shows John's disciples that he's doing exactly what the Bible says the Messiah will do. In other words, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus' words and actions completely line up with the proven word of God. So much so that there could be no doubt as to who he was and what he had come to to do. Jesus shows them, and then he tells them to go back and quote these verses to John, and John, knowing these verses, would also know the context 
and all the verses that surround these, and his faith would be strong again. In the midst of your crisis, turn to the Word of God. In the midst of your suffering, turn to the Word of God. In the midst of your pain, turn to the Word of God. Fill your life with these things. Whatsoever is good and perfect and honorable and of good repute, set your mind on these things, and the God of peace will rule in your heart and mind. Paul says that to the church in Philippi. For John, he knew what Isaiah said about the Messiah. What's interesting to me, and I mentioned it a moment ago, is that the ending of Isaiah 61, 1, he doesn't, he doesn't bring that up, opening the prison to those who are bound. This is a problem John was having, was it not? You see, John's in prison, and he couldn't figure out why he would be in prison if the Messiah were here, because Scripture uh, and prophecy said that the prisons would be opened and the captives would be set free. Well, the prison of sin, those bars were shattered with the death of Christ. Jesus doesn't quote that part. Why? Because it wasn't time yet. In order to set the captives free, Jesus was going to have to die, and the time of his death wasn't at hand yet. For John, he needed to be reminded that some of the promises concerning Messiah were forthcoming. They're, 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 uh, they're, they're going to come to pass, but in God's providence at his time. And they have not all come to pass yet, have they? The dead, you know, don't come up out of the dust yet. The resurrection hasn't happened. We don't, we don't run in resurrected bodies shouting for joy for God. But for John, he needed to be reminded that some of the promises concerning the Messiah had come to pass and others were, were, were yet to happen. John would understand, as he's in prison now, that the day is coming when King Jesus will reign over all the earth. In that day, there will be peace. There will be no more war. There will be peace on earth. Righteousness will reign. We won't have to have disaster relief workers on the uh, uh, the Moldavian and, 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 and uh, uh, Ukraine border to aid refugees. For righteousness is going to reign. And he took comfort for that. In his day, and so can we. King Jesus currently reigns in the heart of believers. But there's a day coming when all the earth will be his footstool and he will reign. And his reign will be universal. Even in the day of John's trial, liberty was proclaimed to the captive. The prison was opened for John and his heart was set free. As we begin to see that King Jesus could be trusted. John took could place his trust squarely and completely in Jesus. And we can place our lives in his hands as well. Now, this isn't all that can be said about John the Baptist. And we'll pick up it later as we come to Mark chapter 6, where it's mentioned again. We'll probably even look at the words that Jesus has about him uh, when he talks about the greatness of this man. But, well, we need to move on, and we'll move on tomorrow and begin tomorrow with the temptation of Christ because that's the very next section in Mark's narrative. But we didn't have a glitch today. It didn't go to pieces, and we have one, one uh, well, smooth, if you can call my voice smooth, but uh, one unhindered Bible study. I love you all. Thank you for being out there. Thank you for coming back after yesterday and plugging in. And I pray it was a little better for you today. May God bless. Father, I thank you so much for the joy of your word. I thank you that we can look at missions and get an understanding of what is happening in the world outside our front door. The work that uh, we are involved in, the work that we are in partnership with, I thank you for that, Lord, and I pray that we will in all ways be found faithful in you and that, Lord, we will just seek you out for guidance as to our participation in what you are doing around the world. Now, Lord, we come thanking you for your word, and I pray, Lord, for each and every one of us, it has been a word of encouragement that, Lord, if there are those who are struggling, and I know there are, that, Father, this day they will turn to you 
and shut the world out because, Lord, they cannot put their mind in your word and still be overwhelmed by the things of this world. And Lord, 15 or 20 minutes in your world can your word can, can pick our spirits up and lift us up above our current circumstances. So, Father, I pray that our mind will be set on you today and that, Lord, we will allow your word to be engrafted into our very heart and that, like John, our faith will be not only renewed if need be, but it will be bolstered and strengthened because, Lord, we know you are the promised one. So anxiously awaited for 2,000 years ago, and we anxiously await for your return today. To you be honor and glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Pearl Harbor Day. We don't say that very often anymore. It doesn't seem, seems like it's kind of gone out of vogue, but I remember all my life growing up that Pearl Harbor Day was a day of remembrance for us. December 7, 1941. May God bless you. I pray that you have a great day today and let God use you only as God can for his glory. May God bless. See you uh, tonight at 6. We'll be back here and then tomorrow again uh, at 9 o'clock. God bless.